business. Please leave your computers and your phones on mute for this event. The speakers will talk for a total of 40 minutes and there will be a Q&A session at the end. To have your questions answered by the speakers, please type your question in the chat box and indicate the speaker or the agency that the question is for. I'll come back at the end and I'll ask the questions in the chat box during the Q&A period. If we don't get to your question before our time is up, please email the speaker and those email addresses and other contact information for the presenters will be displayed during the Q&A period. Thank you all for being here today and being willing to learn about disaster preparedness with us. And with that, Joyce Peach will be introducing today's speakers. Thank you, Patty. First up, we have Jessica Nussbaum from the Maryland Emergency Management Agency. Thank you, Joyce, and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jessica Nussbaum with MEMA. I'm the State Individual Assistance Officer and Community Preparedness Coordinator. Um, some of you might not be familiar with MEMA. We are essentially the state counterpart to FEMA or the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Um, is my first slide available? I just don't want to get too. <laughs> it's up on the screen. Oh, it's, it's, next slide, I'm sorry. Um, so again, we're the State Emergency Management Agency and we are conduit between local and federal emergency management. So each of the counties in Maryland, the 23 counties, as well as the city of Baltimore, the city of Annapolis, and the town of Ocean City all have their own offices of emergency management. And when an event happens in that area and it gets beyond what they can handle Level, they would get in contact with us and we would help make the connection between them and other state agencies or federal resources that may have um, either programs or resources to assist them with recovery and response. Um, we also have a 24-7 watch center or the MJOC, the Maryland Joint Operations Center. We work with the jurisdiction on planning, training, um, training and exercising, outreach and community preparedness, which is where my position falls in. We have a private sector integration program that works with businesses around the state of Maryland and the State Emergency Operations Center, which is what becomes activated to do monitoring when we do have larger events around the state. And our vision is to shape a resilient Maryland where communities thrive, which is definitely a, a good positive thought to have when we start to look at recovering from um, disasters. Next slide. So what I want to talk about, and 10 minutes really isn't too much time to go in detail about emergency preparedness, but I want to touch on some highlights. Um, and a lot of this is probably information that you've already heard that might be in the back of your mind. But since this is Emergency Preparedness Month, um, I just want to make sure everybody is currently thinking about them and thinking about small ways that they might be able to prepare themselves and their households for disaster. Um, so next slide. So the first thing you want to have is a family emergency plan. And this is all of the information that you want to have together in case some kind of disaster strikes and you know what steps to take, who to contact to help you, et cetera. So this is just an example of some information that should be in your family emergency plan. If you go online and look up family emergency plan, family emergency communication plan, you'll find several templates um, and you can pick which one meets your needs. But some of the basic information would be your names, phone numbers, social security numbers, um, insurance information, work and school information, um, an out of state contact. So someone that you know out of the you know, general area where you are in case there's an event that hits that area, somewhere that you know that you can go um, it, until things are safe in your area. Um, if you don't have an out-of-state contact, this might be a plan for staying in a hotel or motel somewhere um, that's far enough away from the event to keep you safe. Um, meeting places locally and regionally, so there's something more isolated like a house fire or flooding on your street uh, and all of your family members aren't together. You'll have somewhere locally that you know you can come together. And then regionally, for example, if you would have to start the evacuation process, maybe you have some folks at home, some folks at school or at work, you know where you can meet up to then continue evacuating. 
Next slide, please. So then talking about an emergency supply kit, first thing we want to think about is food. Definitely perishable foods in case your electricity would go out. You can't really rely on your refrigerator or your freezer. So these are all ready to eat things like canned meats, fruits and vegetables. Um, but make sure that you're also taking into consideration any family members that have dietary restrictions, allergies, anything like that. Um, infants, make sure that you're taking all of that into consideration and you have things in your kit that would also be good for them as well. Um, general guidance is a three-day supply of these foods because that's typically how long it would take um, even in something, you know, rather a, a large event before someone could either get into you or you could get out to get more supplies. Then water. Um, storing water in plastic containers such as soft drink bottles, um, you can do that. You can reuse bottles. Make sure that you're washing them very, very well just so the water doesn't get contaminated and change it out rather often um, so it doesn't get stagnant. Or you could just buy the one gallon containers that are sold in stores or larger. They're you know bigger than one gallon. But make sure you have on hand at least one gallon of water per person per day for a three day time period. So you figure three gallons of water for each person. Um, and keep in mind, food and water both expire. Water typically has an expiration date of about a year after its bottling date. So just make sure you're keeping track of that and switching out items as they're getting close to their expiration. Just putting those food and items and water into your regular use rotation and buying new for your emergency supply kit. Then we have first aid items. Um, you know, this typically if you just buy one of those pre-filled first aid kits to have on hand, that has a lot of your basic items that you need, um, but you can see the list here. Um, it's just a lot of your basic things, some over-the-counter medications, um, bandages, etc. Then other tools and supplies you might want to consider having on hand, paper cups, plates, and plastic utensils um, in case water might not be safe to use or it, you just might not have access to it. You just want some things that you can throw away for a couple days. Your battery operated radio so you can listen to changes in weather forecast or you can listen for any kind of evacuation orders. Make sure you have extra batteries unless it's a hand crank radio. Um, flashlight and extra batteries, because a lot of times in a lot of these different um, weather events, we can lose power. A non-electric can opener. So unless all of your canned goods have a pop top, um, you want to make sure that you have that non-electric can opener to be able to open up all of your items. Um, and again, uh, just some other items that you see on there. A map of the area is really important. I don't know how many other people out there are reliant upon their GPS like I am, um, but maps are a good thing to have in case you don't have signal to your GPS and you aren't overly familiar with areas you might have. Then sanitation, again, a lot of basic items that you just want to make sure that you have. Many of us have these in our homes already, um, but having a small supply for an emergency situation is never a bad idea. Clothing and bedding, um, making sure that you have at least one change of clothing and footwear per person and make sure that you switch this stuff out seasonally so you don't have you know, your sweatshirt and your boots in the summer and you know, tank tops and things like that in the winter. Um, having some blankets, sleeping bags, pillows, um, sunglasses, sturdy shoes, work boots um, are a good idea in case there's a lot of debris around your area when you go to leave your home just so you don't cut your feet. And then rain gear, we see a lot of people, or I'm sorry, a lot of events typically come with a lot of precipitation. So it's a good idea to have a rain jacket or something like that. Then specialty items, all of your important documents, um, either copies of them, originals that you have stored somewhere, or what a lot of people are doing is scanning all of these original documents and keeping them onto a secure USB flash drive. Um, that way it takes up a lot less room and you have access to all of those important numbers and information. If you have children, you're going to want items for them, any kind of medications and things like that. And we'll be talking about pet preparedness here in a minute. Then extra supplies needed currently, um, since we are in a COVID environment, you just want to have those extra supplies on hand. So your masks, hand sanitizer, hand soap, disinfectant spray and wipes, a thermometer just to keep track of fevers and over-the-counter medications that can help reduce fever. 
Then for pet preparedness, because pets are definitely our family too, we want to make arrangements for them. So either looking up options um, where you can bring your pet along with you, so pet-friendly accommodations, or figuring out where boarding facilities might exist that you can leave your pet if you're going somewhere that you can't have pets with you. Um, checking in with your neighbors to develop a buddy system. So if you can't get back to your home, maybe, maybe a neighbor could check in on your pets. Making sure your vehicle is large enough to transport them is really important to think about. Um, if you have several family members, several pets, and your items that you have to transport, make sure you have a plan for that ahead of time and get your pets comfortable with those crates prior to the event because a lot of times if we're stressed and we're putting them in carriers that they haven't been in before, that can create extra stress for our pets. Then an emergency supply kit, there are various items that we definitely want to have for them on hand, food and water, obviously, um, medications, first aid kit for pets, familiar items like blankets, treats, toys, um, just extra things to keep them safe and comfortable. We do have a free app that's available called Maryland Prepares, and you can download this on any of the different platforms. It has a lot of really neat features, so I just recommend um, downloading that. You can get preparedness information, alerts, you can let people know um, that you are safe in an event, um, and then just general news, contact information for your local utility companies, just has a lot of really cool features. So again, that the name of it is Maryland Prepares. If you look at that in your app store or Google Play, um, whatever you use, it should come up for you. And Know Your Zone is a newer initiative that we have here at MEMA. Um, it covers the hurricane evacuation zones in 19 out of our 26 jurisdictions around the state. So if you go to www.knowyourzonemd.com, you can enter your address. It will let you know if you are in a hurricane evacuation zone, um, which zone you're in, and then there's other hurricane preparedness information found on that site as well. So for more information, these are just a couple links that have resources for our page, mema.maryland.gov, then the fema.gov site, and ready.gov is FEMA's page um, that has a lot of preparedness information on it. So I know I went through that super fast. Um, just so you know, I do offer emergency preparedness presentations for different groups around the state. So if that is something that you might be interested in for a civic group, a faith-based organization, a group of neighbors that wanna come together, um, currently we're doing them virtually like this, but um, I can definitely make that happen between myself or our local offices of emergency management. So you can feel free to reach out and I will be available at the end for questions. Thank you all. Thank you, Jessica. Next up, we have Kiana Walton from the Maryland Insurance Administration. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, again, my name is Kiana Walton, and I will be discussing understanding your insurance coverage when it comes to a disaster. Next slide. I will also talk about who the Maryland Insurance Administration is, how we can help, do you have the right coverage to protect you, what to do after a loss, and getting prepared. Next slide. So first, what is the Maryland Insurance Administration? The Maryland Insurance Administration is the state agency that regulates the business of insurance in Maryland. We license insurers and insurance producers, also known as agents and brokers. We examine the business practice of licensees to ensure compliance. We monitor the solvency of insurance companies. We review and approve insurance policy forms. We also review rates to be sure they are not inadequate, excessive, un or unfairly discriminatory. And we investigate consumer and provider complaints and allegations of fraud. Next slide. If you feel that your insurer or insurance producer acted improperly, you have the right to file a complaint. The MIA can investigate complaints that an insurer or insurance producer has denied or delayed payment of all all or portions of your claim, improperly terminated your insurance policy, if they raised your insurance premiums without proper notice or in excess of what the law allows, they've made false statements to you in connection with the sale of your insurance or the processing of your insurance claim, or they've overcharged you for services including premium finance charges. So natural disasters. Maryland in recent years has sustained a, excuse me, a significant amount of damage to their homes 
and personal property as a result of tornadoes, floods, and hurricanes. While you may not be able to control natural disasters, there are steps you can take to lessen the exposure to these types of losses and to ensure that you have the appropriate insurance to cover potential damages. So let's talk about automobile coverage. When it comes to auto insurance coverage, comprehensive coverage provides you with the coverage for property damage to your insured vehicle resulting from occurrences other than collision. So that would be for flooding, theft, vandalism, glass breakage not resulting from an accident or a vehicle striking an animal. Now, if you only have liability coverage, your insurer will not pay for the above type of damages or for damage of your vehicle from a collision. Now, do you have the right homeowner's coverage? You wanna review your policy to de determine what is covered and what is excluded. So are the following covered under your current policy? Windstorm debris, I mean, windstorm damage, debris or tree removal, water sewer backup or additional living expenses. This is an example of your actual declaration page and this identifies the kinds and amount of coverage you have and how much it costs. When you purchase a homeowner's insurance policy, you renew your policy or make any changes to your policy, your insurance company will give you a document which is called your declaration page. Now being prepared, um, doing a home inventory list is something that we feel is important for everyone to do, whether you're a homeowner or a renter. And creating an inventory list of all your possessions. So that would be going through every room in your home, every drawer, every closet, every cabinet, and maybe just taking your phone and video recording each room. And then this will allow you to be able to store the information on your cloud, on your phone, and keep it handy so that if you have a claim or your insurance company asks for proof of what you had, you already have everything documented. And whenever you get something new, we just ask that you update it by again, taking a picture with the receipt or just video recording the item. Next slide. Do you have enough insurance coverage? So you wanna make sure you have enough coverage to repair or rebuild your home in the event of a disaster. You wanna ask your insurance producer or insurer about purchasing coverage to protect against inflation. You wanna also notify your insurance producer or your insurance company if you make any improvements or additions to your home to ensure that they are covered. And then determine whether you need additional coverage for antiques, collectibles, jewelry, computers, or other expensive items that may not be included in basic contents coverage. Next slide. Do you have the right insurance coverage? So you wanna know the difference between actual cash value and replacement cost value. So when you look at your homeowner's coverage, if you have actual cash value, that is the cost to replace the damaged property with like kind quality, but the insurance company will give you the depreciation value for your item. If you have replacement cost value, that is the cost to replace the damaged property with like kind or quality at the full cost without depreciation. So again, you wanna make sure you know whether you have actual cash value or replacement cost value. And it is important to remember, you may not receive the full replacement cost until you actually repair or replace the damaged property. Next slide. Now, insurance preparedness tips also includes knowing what is not covered in your standard homeowner's policy. So that would include mudslide, earth movement or earthquake, groundwater or seepage, and also flood. While some private insurers may offer some coverage for flood as an endorsement to your homeowners, renters, or condominium policy, flood insurance can also be purchased from the National Flood Insurance Program. And Kevin will get into more detail about that during his presentation. Next slide. Know what you will have to pay. You wanna know what your deductibles are. Some policies have a separate percentage deductible for certain types of events. For example, when. 
So some policies have a deductible based on the amount of insurance coverage on your home. So an example would be if your dwelling is insured for a hundred thousand and your policy has a two percent deductible for certain pearls, your deductible would be two thousand for certain perils. So you want to make sure again if you have a flat deductible or percentage deductible, you know what that is. Next slide. Now, if you actually have a loss, you want to contact your insurance company or producer promptly after sustaining the loss. You want to take photos and or videos of the damaged areas. Make only those repairs necessary to prevent any further damage and do not make permanent repairs before talking to your insurance um, company or agent. And before you remove any damaged property from the premises, be sure an insurance adjuster or your insurance producer has seen the damage. Next slide. You want to keep all receipts for emergency repairs and for temporary living expenses. As soon as possible, prepare a detailed inventory list. So again, if you do that ahead of time, you would only have to update your um, inventory list. Give a copy to the insurance adjuster and keep a copy for yourself. It should have description and quantity of items, the date and place of purchase, and the cost estimate to replace. Be present when your insurance adjuster inspects your property and be cautious in accepting a settlement offer or cashing a settlement check. Cashing a check may bar you from seeking additional compensation later on if it turns out that the settlement offer is inadequate. It is a good idea to confirm in writing that cashing the check will not bar you from seeking additional compensation later. And just some reminders, if your insurer denies any part of your claim, be sure that you put the denial, that they put the denial in writing and you keep a copy of all of your paperwork. You can avoid bad repairs and workmanship by using licensed, reputable contractors. Be sure they are secure the appropriate building permit. And you can get that information from the Maryland Home Improvement Commission. They're also who you would contact if you have a complaint. Contact your insurer and claims adjuster anytime you find additional damage not previously reported and inspected. And insurers consider loss history and claim frequency when making decisions on whether they will insure you or renew your policy and the cost of your policy. So you want to make sure that you keep that into consideration when filing a claim with your homeowner's insurance company. And then there, some contact information. If you have any other questions, Maryland Insurance Administration, also listed as our website, the National Flood Insurance Program, um, also their website, um, if you wanna know if you're in a floodplain, and the Maryland Home Improvement Commission. Also Maryland Emergency Management Agency, which Jessica is with and FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And here are some publications also on our website that could help you um, with more information about disaster preparedness. Um, we have our Insurance Preparedness Guide for Natural Disasters, Natural Dis Disaster Preparedness Tips Guide, and the Consumer Advisories on Contractors and Understanding the Difference Between Flood and Water Damage. Thank you. Thank you, Kiana. Next up is Kevin Wagner from the Maryland Department of the Environment. Good afternoon, everyone. I am going to turn my video on so you can see me. Um, it's, it's tough doing these sessions and you're not in person and be able to, to see and interact with folks. So hopefully that helps a little bit. And you can throw things at me virtually. Uh, but again, my name is Kevin Wagner I'm with Maryland Department of the Environment, and I provide community assistance related to the National Flood Insurance Program. So our department does a lot to protect Maryland's air, water, and land resources. I'm in the Water and Science Administration, so uh, you know that's my full-time job is to assist local governments and yourselves with any kind of questions related to floodplain uh, management, mitigation, mapping, insurance, whatever it is. Next slide. So a little background about the National Flood Insurance Program. It, it actually was started in 1968. Um, of course, the nation has gone through a series of de devastating floods, so the, the federal government uh, stepped in, um, but the last 
you know, the, fi the final nail in the coffin was basically Hurricane Betsy in 1965, a uh, catastrophic event that happened in the Gulf down there. It was the first billion dollar disaster. Now it seems like we have them almost every year. Uh, but the National Flood Insurance Program is under FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency. And of course, they are under the Department of Homeland Security. So participation in this program is really voluntary, um, but it really kind of isn't. You know, there's a carrot and stick approach. So you do this community and we'll give you flood insurance through the NFIP. But understand everything that I talk about is related to FEMA, the National Flood Insurance Program uh, and the like and the insurance through that. But there is a separate sort of private flood insurance that you could get. Uh, we just don't know as much about that. It's not as regulated as heavily um, and, and not you know, as easily identifiable with some of the uh, information of how they do the, um, the premiums and whatnot. So, but really it's a partnership between the local government. We call them communities. So we gotta be careful when we say community. In my terms, I'm meaning you know, local governments that have land use authority. Next slide. So there's kind of three main components of the National Flood Insurance Program. You got the maps and data where you know your risk, identify that risk. Um, the floodplain management part where communities will review building permits and apply appropriate standards. Also, if, if things uh, are, are damaged or improved or you know, during that permit process, there's an opportunity to do some mitigation measures to prevent future losses. Uh, this is kind of that reduce your risk category. And then, you know, the big part of the program is flood insurance. But really, if we've done the other two correctly, you should yield a favorable flood insurance premium under that flood, uh, the insure your risk category. Next. So we're going to step e through each one of these sort of categories quickly as I can within nine or eight minutes left. But know your risk maps and data. Um, we're really talking about the flood insurance rate maps. Those are the maps that are produced by the Federal Emergency Management Agency. Uh, understand that that sets certain standards. You know, there's, it's based on that 100-year flood that we talk about a lot, but really what that is is me, it means there's a 1 in 100 chance of a flood of that magnitude uh, of occurring in any given year. So you could have multiple 100-year events uh, in, in the same month or the same year. Uh, but this is kind of the foundation of the program. This is what we use to kind of uh, help regulate development, look at per building permit applications, but it's also on the for the insurance rating side. But many communities go beyond that. They'll look at areas outside these areas and, and what, what, what do things look like into the future? What are the 2050 and 2100 sea level rise projections? Are there historic high water marks, et cetera? Next. So the flood insurance rate map, like I said, it delineates those minimum standards, that 100 year flood or that 1% annual chance. They also map the 500 year flood plane or the 0.2% annual chance. But know that, you know, floods don't read maps. It's, it's gonna flood wherever the water wants to go. And we see that a lot. We're seeing it frequently. Uh, these very intense rainstorms that areas are flooding and just getting uh, uh, very deep water in, in these areas, especially where we need to drive. So be careful about that. Turn around, don't drown. Uh, but it is the national standard. That's what we base our program on. Some communities are starting to go beyond that, though. Next slide. So there are various tools where you can go to kind of view this risk. Um, we like to uh, promote our site, mdfloodmaps.net. So you can go on there and type in your address and learn. So this is just an example of a screenshot of what that looks like. So that blue shaded area is the high risk or that 100 year floodplain area. And the orange on the fringes is that 500 year floodplain. So again, uh, the mandatory insurance you know, aspects and development aspects are all in that blue shaded area. Next. You can also go to FEMA's Map Service Center website, msc.fema.gov, and that has a wealth of information that you can also um, obtain the mapping information. You could create uh, little firmets, which is kind of like a version of the, of the flood insurance rate map. Uh, and there's a variety of other things that you can get on there. We can probably spend a half a day talking about that alone. Next slide. But one of the things you can do, which would be a neat homework assignment for you, is to go to that Map Service Center website, type in your address, and see if you can create something like this for your area. Uh, we call this a firmet. We enc encourage all of our community floodplain managers to, to do this as, as they are reviewing permit applications. Um, but this is just a great tool here uh, to kind of view that information. Next. Understand there are different zones, high-risk zones, moderate zones. 
low risk zones, but we're not concentrating on those high risk zones, the A's, the AEs, the VEs. And that's, again, that's the, the, the mandatory purchase areas. Next. Moving around the circle, going into reduce your risk, floodplain management regulations, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but this is where your local governments come into play. So they, they adopt certain standards and protocols that are based on minimums, and many go beyond that. But understand there are also building code requirements that are meshing up very closely with all of these things. Next. But some communities go beyond that. So instead of just looking at the number on the map, some communities say, well, I want to elevate two feet higher. I want to elevate three feet higher. So that's what, what we call it freeboard. But you know, there are various kind of things like this that communities can do to help redu further reduce risk. Next. So freeboard, basically, as you go up, your risk is lower. But guess what? You also save some money. Um, you get to a point of diminishing return once you get to about three feet. Uh, but hey, we still think it's a good idea to elevate as high as possible because, uh, again, you're protecting lives and property, uh, but also saving money on your flood insurance. Next. Here's some examples around the state. Crisfield, an elevated structure. Next. Here's one in Calvert County, elevated in a VE zone, so it's open beneath for wave action and velocity. Next. So moving to reduce your risk, flood mitigation, you know, it's more than just elevating homes. Let's look at all the equipment, the electrical mechanical equipment, using flood damage resistant materials, anchoring fuel tanks, et cetera. Next. What are we talking about flood damage resistant materials? Well, we don't, don't use drywall. Don't use regular fiber, fiberglass insulation. Use materials that if they were submerged for long periods of time, um, you can hose them off, you're ready to go. Next. Flood openings are critically important in elevated structures. So these are things that automatically equalize the water pressure that's on the walls. And there are certain criteria that we won't get into the details of, but understand this is a critical part of proper flood insurance rating. So it's good to have your home elevated or business, but you also have to have these flood openings in your crawl space to get the proper elevation credit. Next. Just another graphic about how these flood openings uh, you know, look on, in certain aspects here, but they have to be within 12 inches of grade. Next. This is one where accidentally the homeowner covered it. They didn't realize what they were doing. So instead of it now being rated as an elevated structure, it's now being elevated at the ground floor, basically where that grass is. Um, but you know, we don't want to cover those things. Next. Subgrade crawl spaces. So if you take off your access door and you have to go down, uh, we consider that a basement. Um, when it's below grade on all four sides, it's a technical basement and your insurance may be higher, especially higher when it's more than two feet. Next. Backflow prevention. Is it something else to think of? As the floodwaters rise, you don't want it to back up into your house. So you can put these devices in there to prevent that water and sewer backup. Next. Example of the HVAC system elevated. Next more HVACs and flood openings, electric meters, you know, so we're all over the state. Next. So utilities, don't forget about those, elevating them. Next. Fuel tanks, we often forget about those, but those need to be anchored because they are buoyant, they will float away. Next. So they're just oil tanks, propane tanks. Next. Keep going. And then sheds, don't forget about those accessory structures. They too need to be anchored and have flood openings. Next. The elevation certificate's a great tool for documenting all this. And I know I'm about out of time. And I just had my alarm go off, so uh, next. And this is just showing you some elevation projects that have gone on in Crisfield, next. So in summary, there's just a variety of things you could do. You know, we didn't talk about this, but cleaning ditches and gutters around your home elevating things off the floor, washer and dryer, all those things are kind of low cost and then you know we can get more into the higher cost category. But there are simple things you can do today to help reduce your risk. Next. And these this slides will go out and you get all these links, but there's a lot of great publications. Next. One of which I like the best is this one, protect your home from flooding, low cost things you can do yourself. Next. And that's all I have. Keep going. Thank you, Kevin. Next up, we have Candace Coven from the American Red Cross.
So good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Candace Coven. I am the Disaster Program Manager for Prince George's County and Charles County in the state of Maryland. So just wanted to talk to you today about a couple of things about preparedness essentials. You've heard quite a bit about how to be prepared. Um, if you don't know already, the mission of the Red Cross is meant to prevent and alleviate human suffering in the face of emergencies by mobilizing the power of volunteers and the generosity of donors. And I really love this mission statement because the most powerful thing in there that I like is mobilizing the power of volunteers um, to alleviate that human suffering because 90 to 93% of all of the American Red Cross staff are volunteers, and that's a lot uh, for any organization. And of course, we depend on the generosity of donors. So whenever and whenever, wherever and whenever we're needed, that's where we respond. Um, most of the time, you'll see us in the news, like we're at the big ones, we're at the hurricanes down in Louisiana, perhaps out in the wildfires. We have hundreds of volunteers on the ground right now providing disaster relief services around the country. But we also have responses that happen every day, disasters. Um, just recently, we had quite a bit of flooding throughout Prince George's County as of last Thursday. We also respond to fires every single day, home fires. You know, whenever there's a fire or an emergency and the fire department is called to the scene, um, one of the first uh, agencies that the fire department will call is the Red Cross because we're there to help with those immediate needs for folks that are displaced by disasters. And during that flooding, we were out in the community um, last Thursday and Friday and through the weekend helping people with, with uh, flooding. So the odds are disasters will strike. Um, I've never been to a disaster and I've been doing this for several years now where people say, I know I was next on a list. I knew what happened to me. So disasters happen often and sometimes without any warning. Um, they can affect any community. No one's immune to it or exempt from it. And we need you to make sure that you're aware of the disasters in your community. For example, we've talked about the flooding. We, we see the natural disasters, but those fires that happen every day, many people are not ready for those because they're always thinking about the big tropical storm coming through or the hurricane. But we need to make sure that we're thinking of those things that can happen daily, regardless of whether it's a natural disaster or not. So again, do not count on receiving help right away. Unfortunately, first responders, disaster organizations, government agencies, and hospital rooms, they do their best, but you have to be prepared to take care of yourself um, if an emergency happens because um, first responders will not always be there immediately. Sometimes the roads might be impassable. Sometimes utilities may be unavailable. Sometimes the, the hospitals of the first responders are overwhelmed. Even grocery stores and pharmacies and schools, they may be closed. And um, as you all already know, if someone said today that there's a hurricane coming in tomorrow, the grocery stores will be packed, right? Because people are going out there trying to be, they're being reactive as opposed to proactive. So the way that you can prepare is to help us by staying safe and adapting to, adapting to the challenges and recovering quickly. We've already talked about, or my colleagues have already talked about, get a kit, make a plan, and be informed. But I do want you to know that there's resources that are available to you from the Red Cross that where we give presentations for the community on how to be prepared for emergencies. We talk about getting a kit, making a plan, and be informed. What goes in that kit? Um, a plan. What does that plan include? You know, is this a plan just for yourself? Is it for your household, or perhaps a family member, or a neighbor that you're keeping an eye on? So we talk to you about how to develop plans for them, but also to how to be informed, to be informed for an emergency because, you know, everyone, you know, when they're looking for their news, they're looking at their cell phones, they're looking at the television, looking at news, but what happens when you lose access to your phone or perhaps you don't have utilities in your home where you can watch the news? How are you going to receive your information? What is your plan to be informed during an emergency? So in, when you're developing that kit, that plan, you need to make sure that you're including the right details. And even on the screen, as you can see where it says, how to evacuate, um, when there is flooding in the communities and they're shutting off roads, I can't tell you how many people say, well, you know, I don't know how, I don't know another route to my house. This is the way I've always gone. I've li year, lived here for years. This is my route. Well, we have to figure out another route just in case you're in one of those low line or flooding or areas that prone to flooding. 
where to meet. You know, sometimes you can you can uh, lose touch with family or friends. Perhaps if you develop a a plan up front where you can tell a family member that look, if something should happen, if I'm not here at the house, I'll be at you know our cousin's house. You know. A, one city over, or perhaps I'll be at another's neighbor, another neighbor's house in the next community over. But those are the things that we want to make sure that you include in those plans. We want to make sure that, again, you have those important documents. And I can't tell you how many uh, disasters that I've been on where folks say that, you know, I had my emergency documents in a fireproof safe. Okay, so where's the fireproof safe? In the basement of the house that just burned down, or perhaps I don't know because the flood waters took it away. So we want to have some other ways that you can um, keep those important records close to you. Um, and other ways could be probably storing important documents in the cloud. But again, those presentations that we do out in the community, we talk about other ways that you can store documents, of course, having them on you and that, that waterproof bag, that is definitely the preferred. Also, we talk about you know where you'll stay just in case there's an emergency. Um, again, people are displaced every day by fires, floods, emergencies, and they have no idea where they're going to next because they never thought it would help to happen to them. Um, one of the things that we do have is our safe and well system and we use this website it's 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 something that we use during disasters during emergencies and i won't go into the details but we'll definitely include the link but we encourage folks when you see those storms coming through your area uh, to use that safe and well to help with family reunification also there's so many tools that are out there that emergency contact card, um, you know, once upon a time we used to have these little books and we would write addresses and phone numbers in them. A lot of people don't use those address books anymore. They use their cell phone for all of their contacts, all of their information. But unfortunately, sometimes you won't have that cell phone or you won't have access to it. So emergency contact cards, an address book is something that we highly encourage as well. There's different apps that are out there in the app store as well as on Google Play. Um, the biggest thing is know what disasters that are most likely to happen in your area. Have a household disaster plan. And when we say a household disaster plan, it's great if you know the plan, but make sure everyone else in your house knows the plan as well. Have a disaster preparedness kit. And it's okay to have several kits, meaning that you may have one at home, you may have one in your car, you may have one in your workplace. Remember, that's the kit that has to go. If, you're, if you have to leave your house in an emergency, you want to be able to grab that kit and run out the door if needed, or perhaps if you need to shelter in place somewhere where you can get to it. What you don't want to do is make a nice disaster preparedness kit and have it in the basement or in the garage or in a closet because it's not ready to go. It's more like a go bag, getting ready to leave the home in case of an emergency or perhaps if you have to shelter in place, you want to have access to it. And at least one member of your household trained in CPR and first aid. So here's the one app that if I said any of those that I highly recommend that you download now, it's the emergency app because you can you can monitor severe weather, you can get emergency alerts. And this is a little different from that emergency alert that comes through your phone, that beeping sound. This has additional information on there and you can also uh, put in different locations of family members probably around the country if you have people that don't live close but you wanna keep an eye on what's going, in, going on in their area as well. We also have adult preparedness education presentations. We do these presentations um, virtually during this COVID environment. We offer these presentations for free to the community. The preparedness pre presentations are about 45 to 60 minutes long. We have one designed specifically for um, older adults because we know that their needs may be a little bit different um, than, than the, other, the younger population, meaning that not everyone is on social media or download naps and not everyone has the same type of um, access or functional needs. That might be something to consider. But we have presentations for each age group, um, older adults, adults, period, um, youth preparedness programs and our youth preparedness programs. Um, the Pillowcase Project is a project that um, we reach out to children and we show them how to make a preparedness kit in their pillowcase and what to include in there. We have Prepare with Pedro for our younger K through second graders. And we also have this Monster Guard app it's a preparedness app for children, and it's uh, it was created by Disney, so it's very colorful, colorful and interactive. And again, these presentations, um, 
can be done virtually as well. So you're welcome to uh, reach out to us if you're interested in that. Something else we wanted to tell you about is helping children cope because sometimes we're so busy trying to get our households in order and trying to make a plan that we forget about our children and how they cope with, with disasters or emergencies. So we also have presentations that include um, how to help children cope with the disasters as well as emotional health for other folks that are placed uh, displaced by disasters. And although we're in this COVID environment, um, you know, we, we don't exactly say it's a disaster, but it is a stressful situation. And you need to know how to um, know the signs of stress as well as um, where to get help when you need it. So very briefly, we all know what's going on with COVID right now. We know the actions, cleaning our hands, keeping, avoiding close contacts, stay home as much as possible, covering our, our mouth and our nose and our sneezes and disinfecting. But also too, even though we're practicing social distancing, we want to stay connected because a lot of people are experiencing, yes, I'm home, but I'm limited to contact visit with my family, with my friends, which could really lead to some um, emotional concerns for uh, individuals. So when we talk about create a household plan, remember in this, in this COVID environment that we also want to make sure that you have accesses to, access to resources, such as your medications and two-week supply of food. All of that's important, too, while you're um, kind of on this lockdown in your homes or in your way from the schools and workplaces. Make sure that uh, we... Candace, I'm sorry. Candace, um, if you could wrap it up shortly, we have to uh, leave the last few minutes that we have for Q&A. Absolutely. So the last thing that I will show it, share with you right now is your resources. Just knowing your resources, finding your local food bank, and this too will be posted for you. 211. And out of this whole slide, I would say the most important here is UntBertha.com. If you've never heard of UntBertha.com, it's a social networking site where you can find free and reduced cost services to assist when you're displaced by emergencies or disasters. I highly recommend that you take a look at that site and bookmark it. You do not need a login. It's a free service. Thank you so much. Thank you so much to all of our presenters. Um, I'm gonna start our Q&A session here. Um, we just have a few questions. And then the first one I'm just gonna go ahead and answer. Um, a couple people asked, will we be able to get a copy of the PowerPoint that's available? Or it will be available. That's gonna be available on our website. That's www.insurance.maryland.gov. And um, under the consumer link, there's going to be a tab for webinars and videos, and that should be posted shortly in the next day or so if you're interested in getting a copy of this PowerPoint. Uh, the first question I have here is for Kevin, um, and this is from Althea. She said, if you live in an AE floodplain, Kevin, is the recommendation to just be properly insured and ready for an emergency, like a go bag? Etc. Yeah, thank you for that question. She's been asking some some good ones in the chat box there. But uh, I would say all Marylanders need to be prepared, not just in our flood prone areas. Uh, also, wanted to make a clear distinction between the information that Jess uh, presented from MEMA, she, the Know Your Zone. Those are your hurricane evacuation areas where you tend to get more wind and wave action type of deals. So that that similar but not exactly the same as flood you know floodplain areas uh, but certainly if you're in a high risk flood zone you need to start looking at your individual flood risk evaluate what's impacted start making some adjustments but certainly all Marylanders should have uh, preparedness information go kits and be ready to go all right thanks Kevin and what about the question uh, what can what can be done to prevent water and sewer backups I, I briefly showed you a slide where there's backflow prevention valves that you can install. Um, that's got to be done between the service connection, usually on the municip municipal end and the property owner side. So that would require some busting up at the floor or installing it uh, you know, out on the roadside or the, uh, in, in your yard. But there are backflow prevention devices you can do to prevent that water and sewer backup. Thanks. 
Uh, Althea asked another question, and she was wondering about her HOA, if that's responsible for the flood insurance, and is she responsible for the coverage for her contents? I'm not sure if you can address that, but if you can. I'll take a stab can, at it. And I'll yeah, thank you. Because I didn't have a lot of information on insurance in there. Um, sure. I, I'm not sure if, if how that got mixed in the signal. Uh, but but to oh, understand, it, yeah, Eric, yeah. with flood insurance, there's different types of coverages. You know, so you got building coverage, you have contents coverage. So really, anybody can purchase flood insurance from the National Flood Insurance Program, even renters, because um, they can get contents coverage. Um, but when you're talking about building coverage, you know, what type of building are we talking about? Are we talking about a residential or non-residential? Um, and there's kind of different policies for that, you know, uh, these forms. And then when in terms of Althea, she was talking about townhomes and specifically condominiums. That gets a little tricky. Um, I'm not real strong in that, but that's a different sort of rating process, uh, the residential condominium association package that they deal with. But typically it's the condominium association or homeowners association is looking at that. Uh, if you're not sure, ask them uh, just, to, just to double check that. But oftentimes in condos, they do coordinate that flood insurance coverage for that for that particular group of homes. All right, thanks, thanks, Kevin. And another question, and this is going to be for Jessica: um, Are there resources that provide emergency management training for the average Marylander? Yeah, I actually just responded back to try to get a little bit more information. And Althea just <laughs> wrote back um, to be more prepared. Yeah, absolutely. So the preparedness presentations that I was talking about, as well as Red Cross, um, are offered all over the state. So I think they both offer a somewhat um, similar presentation, but just talking about general preparedness. Um, I can talk specifically about the presentation that I um, I talk about some of the more common hazards that we experience here in Maryland, what to do to be more prepared for those types of hazards, and then go through in more detail kind of what the end of my presentation was like, just talking about supply kit items, resources that we have available through MEMA. Um, sometimes we do those presentations in conjunction with our local offices of emergency management, um, just to kind of bring in that local perspective as well, so we can kind of customize presentations. And again, I've done them for all kinds of neighborhood groups, civic groups, and any kind of group of people that wants to get together to learn more about preparedness. So you can definitely you know, feel free to reach out to myself, Candice, um, any of us would be able to help you out with that. Patty, this is Joy. Yes. And I want to go back to um, Althea's question for a second about condominiums. Althea, before you purchase a policy on a condominium, I would suggest that you have a conversation with someone who is familiar with the insur flood insurance for condominiums, because that can be a little bit tricky. Because as I'm sure you already know, for your personal homeowner's policy for a condominium, you're buying a policy to cover not only your contents, but your improvements to that condominium. So you need to make sure when you're talking to someone about flood insurance, that the improvements that you've made, and that can be anything from any upgrades to the flooring or things like that, that are going to be covered. So make sure you speak with someone that's knowledgeable about flood insurance for a condominium, just to make sure that all of your items are properly taken care of. Thanks, Joy. There's just one more comment in the chat from James Krempel, who recommends community emergency response CERT training. I don't know if you wanted to comment on that, Jessica. Yeah, absolutely. CERT is most definitely a great resource. Um, not all of the areas around Maryland have robust CERT teams. Um, you want to definitely look online to see if there is one available um, within your jurisdiction, but they do a lot of training about emergency preparedness, what you can do to help your neighbors during a, a disaster. Um, it is a really good program. Great. Thanks, Jessica. Um, well, that's, uh, that's all we had for the q and A. I I just want to say thank you to all the speakers today. Uh, we encourage you to talk to your friends and family about the material that was presented today. 
talk to them about how you will communicate before, during, and after a disaster. And make sure to update your plan based on the Centers for Disease Control's recommendations now due to the coronavirus. Remember, if you have kids at home or even kids away at college, talk to them about preparing for emergencies and what to do if you're separated. And reassure them by providing the information um, and letting them know how they can get involved. We hope to see all of you at events in the future. We have another virtual event coming up. We're calling it Be More Prepared for Urban Flooding. So Be More Prepared for Urban Flooding, that's going to be on October 22nd from 1 to 2.30 p.m. You can register for this event on Eventbrite. And if you register on Eventbrite, you'll receive reminders from us. Um, and again, be more prepared for urban flooding, October 22nd. And thank you all for attending our event. If you have other questions, please um, use the email addresses on the screen. Thank you all so much.